Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest making his fourth appearance on our show is a popular and highly respected author whose books about the entertainment world are as insightful, entertaining, and compelling as the iconic superstars and movies he writes about. He's written seven best-selling books, including The Sound of Music Story, The Godfather Effect, Changing Hollywood, America, and Me, The Importance of Being Barbara, and Barbara Cook, Then and Now. The first time he came on our show, we discussed his book, Considering Doris Day, which is a must read for every fan of this beloved and in some ways hugely underrated actress and singer. In his second appearance, we discussed his monumentally important book, Why to Kill a Mockingbird Matters. If you haven't yet read that book, I highly recommend it for its brilliant analysis of racism in America in the context of one of the greatest novels and movies of all time. When our guest last appeared on our show, we discussed his wonderful book, Sinatra in Hollywood, shining a well-deserved light on Frank Sinatra's screen legacy, which has often been overshadowed by his extraordinary achievements as a singer and recording artist. And now our guest is back to discuss his latest book, The Way We Were, The Making of a Romantic Classic. The book commemorates the 50th anniversary of the iconic 1973 movie starring Barbra Streisand and Robert Redford as the quintessential mismatched lovers who were political and emotional opposites, but whom we were all desperately rooting for. The movie broke box office records worldwide and earned a slew of nominations and awards, including six Academy Award nominations and two Golden Globe nominations. Barbara Streisand got an Oscar and Golden Globe and BAFTA nomination for Best Actress, and she won two prestigious International Best Actress Awards. The movie ranks at number six on the American Film Institute's list of the top 100 love stories in the history of American cinema. And the music from the movie has been as highly acclaimed as the film itself, winning two Oscars for Marvin Hamlish, one for Best Original Dramatic Score, and one, along with Marilyn and Alan Bergman, for Best Original Song, for which they also won a Golden Globe Award. The original soundtrack recording won a Grammy Award, and that amazing, timeless, classic song, The Way We Were, sung so beautifully by Barbara Streisand, not only won the 1974 Grammy Award for Song of the Year, the song was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 1998, and it ranks as number eight on the American Film Institute's list of the top 100 songs in American movies. And if that weren't enough, the song is included on the list of songs of the century, compiled by the Recording Industry Association of America and the National Endowment for the Arts. Our guest's wonderful, exquisitely written book, provides the definitive inside story behind the making of a movie which is widely considered to be the most beloved romantic drama of the last 50 years. I'm delighted to welcome back to our show the brilliant Tom Santo Pietro, my very dear friend. Tom, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for having me back. I've been looking forward to this talk. <laughs> me too, Tom. I'll start with the obvious question. Why did you write the book? I wrote the book because it started to dawn on me that people didn't just like this movie, they obsessed over it. And I heard, would hear people quoting the dialogue word for word. And I thought, now that's really interesting. And then when I started to dive into research and I thought, maybe I want to write about this. What I realized is that it would complete my trilogy of books about movies that people don't just like but return to over and over and over again, those being The Godfather, The Sound of Music, and now The Way We Were. Because they're all movies that people, it says something very elemental about their lives, and that interests me. Now, besides the two stars, Barbara Streisand and Robert Redford, the key players behind this film were Ray Stark, the producer, Arthur Lawrence, the screenwriter, and Sidney Pollack, the director. I want to focus on Arthur Lawrence for a moment. How much of the Katie Morosky character did he base on the real Barbara Streisand? Certainly a portion of the character was based on Barbara. Elements like fast talking, fast thinking, 
very politically involved. Those are all aspects of Barbara Streisand's own personality. And it started because when he was chatting with Barbara one day, she reminded him of one of his college classmates, a woman ironically named Fanny Price, one letter different than Fanny Bryce, funny girl character. So, you know, it was sort of a combination of Arthur thinking about his college classmate and, as you asked, about Barbara's own personality and elements, interestingly, uh, taken from Arthur Lawrence's own life as well. You mentioned Barbara's strong liberal political convictions. There's also her intensity, her fierce passion. Her She's unrelentingly serious. That's always the way I see her when she's being herself. A- absolutely. Which len- lends another layer of irony to the fact that her most famous starring vehicle is Funny Girl, because Barbara herself is, as you said, she's pretty intense. So she wants to get the job done. So it all, out of all of these different disparate elements, you know, came a really interesting character. And what about Robert Redford's character, Hubble Gardner, the waspy, confident, golden boy, jock, heartthrob, who can easily skate through life without having to work very hard? How much of that character do you think was the real Robert Redford? I would say just like Barbara with the character of Katie, parts of Redford were in the character. You you know, Redford is an extraordinarily handsome guy very athletic, you know, charming, all of those elements. But just as the character of Hubble turns out to have a real talent for writing, you know, Robert Redford's a guy who doesn't skate through life on charm and is seriously involved with environmental issues, for instance, and starting the Sundance Film Institute. So, you know, there's it's like an iceberg. There's a lot beneath the surface of the water. In writing about the on-screen chemistry between Barbara Streisand and Robert Redford, you hinted in the book that Barbara may have had a crush on Robert Redford in real life. Her makeup man certainly thought she did. So I went back and watched the movie. I think it shows. Do you? I I think, sure, it does. I mean, it it brings the film to another level. I think Barbara probably had a a crush on Robert Redford the way I think every woman in America at that time, at his height of his popularity in the early 70s, I think all women did, and probably a lot of guys too, you know, he he was uh, so good looking. So I think their personalities and that attraction she may have had for Redford that informed the film. That's what gives it another level because you have that personal attraction, you have their disparate personalities, their disparate acting styles, and all of that informs the characters and really brings the story to another level. That's what makes it so interesting to watch. Oh, absolutely. You mentioned their different acting styles. I mean, she was so intense and constantly rehearsing and stressing over every detail, and he was laid back and relaxed. Given those differences in the way they worked, are you surprised that the chemistry between them on screen was so good? I'm actually not that surprised because I think, you know, as human beings, you know, opposites attract and sparks come out of opposite personalities and approaches. And I think in terms of just acting in the movie, even though their styles are different, they were still inhabiting the same universe of telling this particular story. And so I think it really worked. And I don't, my own feeling is never again did either of them have a on screen partner where it worked that well. That's true. You wrote about Streisand's unique blend of bulldozer force and genuine vulnerability. She was not pretty in the traditional sense, but she knew how to make herself an object of sexual desire on screen with men like Omar Sharif, Ryan O'Neill, George Segal, James Caan, Nick Nolte, and of course, Robert Redford. Tom, are you able to put into words what it is about her that makes her a convincing leading lady in a love story? I I think that's a really good question. I think that well, first of all, I, 
given the right role, she is uh, can be a very effective actress. And this was the right role. So you're interested in what she's doing on screen. You know, you with a real star, you're always wondering, what are they really thinking? So she connects on that level. I, I think also my phrase about her is that she carries a charge. And part of that is a sexual charge. It's just in a different package than Hollywood had ever glimpsed before. And I think we're intrigued by that. And I, you know, put that together with a, what I always think of as her extraordinary force and real vulnerability. And you're just interested watching her on the screen. And at a very elemental level, it, because one of the big things in, as I call it, Streisand cinema is Barbara chasing after and getting the golden boy, whether it's Ryan O'Neill or Nick Nolte, or, you know, we're interested in her pursuit of that. Is she going to be able to be successful? You wrote that of all the movies Robert Redford made and all the on-screen partnerships he had with every female star from Jane Fonda to Meryl Streep, he never again generated the heat on screen that he did with Barbara Stress and In the Way We Were. Why do you think that was? I, I think, and I do believe that. I think if you go back and you look, he co-starred three times with Jane Fonda. He made Out of Africa with Meryl Streep. I mean, the pairings work, but they don't have that electric charge that this does. I think the reason why neither of them ever had a pairing quite as good again is twofold. No, number one is, of course, the idea of opposites attracting and sparks. And Barbara and Redford are so opposite, but he's not that opposite from Jane Fonda or Meryl Streep or Michelle Pfeiffer. You know, it's kind of a pairing of very nice looking waspy types. But I think also on a different level, it's their personalities and the characters because it's about loving the wrong person. And so you look at the differences in how they appear and you think, oh, they shouldn't be together, typically speaking, and yet I want them to be together. And that that really informs an audience reaction and I think deep in the film. Jerome Robbins famously said about Barbara Streisand that she does everything wrong, but it comes out right. What do you think he meant by that? I think it means that taken objectively, you would think, oh, Barbara's over the top. You know, the gestures are too big. She's going for too much of an effect. But because she has that inherent talent, the passion lying behind it, it still comes out right because you respond emotionally to her. And that's what the biggest stars do. We They give us a rooting interest and, a, and just an interest, period. Tom, as you well know, Barbara Streisand has been described as controlling, argumentative, extremely intense, and an obsessive worrier about every detail to the point of being not just a perfectionist, but obsessive. Everyone agrees that she's absolutely brilliant, with an incredibly strong work ethic. But from your research, both for this book and your earlier book about Barbara, what's your opinion of what she's like to work with? I think the first word that uh, pops into my mind is intense. And I think she does obsess over every detail. And I think it could bother a lot of people, rub them the wrong way, but it always comes from a good place. And that good place is she wants it to be as good as it possibly can be. And she wants everybody else up to that level of caring. And of course, not many people obsess to that degree. So I think that's where the reports come from. But my own take on it is that it is a, from a good place. And she herself said something really interesting years ago, which is she said, I'm just very blunt. It saves me a lot of time, but it loses me a lot of friends. And I think that's the flip side of it. It's too bad because if you know where it's coming from, that's such an important thing you said, that it's coming from a good place. It's not designed 
to antagonize people or to be a diva. It's that she has a vision and she wants that vision executed and manifested exactly the way she sees it. Absolutely. She she really does worry over every last detail. And Sidney Pollack, the director of the film, with whom she had a very good relationship, and they stayed friends for the rest of his life. And he, he talked about that. He said that all of her constant questions, she would call him on the phone every night during shooting with endless questions about what they had done and what they were going to do. And he said, but it all comes from a good place because she wants it to be great. And then he sort of laughed and said, but sometimes I wanted to say, would you just relax for a minute? So I think that's the dichotomy there. One of the coolest things about your book, Tom, which I discovered in the acknowledgments, is that Barbara Streisand actually contributed to your book because you thank her. Tell us about that. That was a probably the, the most interesting part, of course, of the whole process, which is that through Barbara's personal manager of 60 years, Marty Ehrlichman, I was able to... He, he said, submit questions in writing and I will get them to Barbara's office and let's see what happens. And so I thought a long time about the questions because the questions couldn't just be, did you like Robert Redford? No. They had to be serious questions about the film. About a month later, I opened up my email and I saw the words for Thomas Santo Pietro from Barbara Streisand. And, you know, I did a triple take and what was so interesting about it was that every question I asked, she it was very clear she had written these answers herself. This was not from an assistant. And they were paragraph long answers to every question. And I realized, and especially as we went forward, the back and forth, every word matters to her. Literally every word matters to her. And taking it sort of one step further, I thought, oh, well, this is a perfect example of why she was one of the foremost interpreters of Stephen Sondheim, because Sondheim's dictum is God is in the details. And to Barbara Streisand, every detail matters. I really relate to that. When I was a judge mm -hmm. and I would write my decisions, Every single word in those decisions mattered. There was nothing superfluous. There was nothing unintended. And I agonized over the nuance of every word. And I have to tell you that as an interviewer, I do the same thing. My introductions, I work hours on getting the exact order of sentences and the right sentence structure. And the same with my questions. So I really relate to what you just said. I love yeah. that about her. It, it's, you know, every one of those details is the, they, that makes up the mosaic, right? That's the, that completes the picture. So, you know, it's the Sondheim song, putting it together bit by bit. And that's what I think informs Barbara's approach to her work as both an actress and a singer. And I, I read one time, uh, Sondheim was talking about her and he said when they had worked together on the Broadway album and worked together very closely, and he said the thing that surprised him in such a pleasant way is, he said, she worried about what the line of the French horn was as much as she did about her own vocal. That's the perfect example. It sure is. So when you got those answers from Barbara to your questions, did anything surprise you? I think what surprised me was probably how total her recall was from 50 years ago. I mean, 50 years, you know, we forget things from yesterday, but she really remembered every detail. And I had started a question about the song with something I had read in Marvin Hamlish's autobiography. And in the middle of my question, she wrote in red letters, that's not true. So I, 
I thought, wow, she really does remember everything. That that was and the extent of her passion. But then the extent of her passion is what interests me about her. Has she read the book? Do you know? I don't know the answer to that question. That that's a really good question. I did. Uh, I think I will hear from her or from her reps down the line a little bit. The book is new. It's only a month old. I did receive a really nice email about the book from Lois Childs, who has the second female lead in the in the movie. And uh, so it was really nice to hear from her and her thoughts about the book and about the movie, which from 50 years ago still holds such a place in, in her heart. Well, I'm going to send this interview to Marty Ehrlichman to send to her because I think she will appreciate this conversation. Oh, well, I, I, that would be very nice. I, you know, I, it's clear I admire her enormously. I think that, you know, these giant talents, and she's one of them, Sinatra's another one, they're just endlessly interesting to us because not only the work product, but we're fascinated by what's the engine that drives them? What, what's the why behind it? And that that's, you know, we're all fascinated by human behavior. Now, Tom, you did not mention Robert Redford in your acknowledgments. So can I assume that you tried to reach him, but were unsuccessful? I The short answer is, I ran out of time with Redford because I did have a lengthy back and forth with his representatives. And what was really interesting was that the first question Redford's representatives asked was, have you spoken to Barbara? And the first question that Barbara's representatives had asked was, had you spoke, had I spoken to Redford? And I think, and, and I had gotten as far as submitting questions to Redford, they were considering it. And I think that because I was on such a tight deadline, by the time I had spoken to Barbara and could then go back to Robert Redford, if I'm explaining that properly, now that I had spoken to Barbara, the deadline had passed. I, I just, if I had another month, I think it would have worked out. But I admire his performance enormously. He's really good in the film. It's all this underacting. It's all the the, the glances and the hesitations. And it's, it's he's a great screen actor. I was surprised to learn from your book that Robert Redford very reluctantly agreed to play the role of Hubble after being pressured and cajoled by his friend Sidney Pollack for eight months. Redford kept saying that he didn't want to play a good-looking, one-dimensional, cardboard, cutout, Prince Charming with no real substance. What do you think finally got Redford to say yes to being in the movie? He he was that reluctant. You're absolutely right. He felt that it was weighted much too strongly in Katie's favor, the character of Katie. And I think two things convinced him in the end. Number one is he had total trust in Sidney Pollack as director. They had worked together already and he he trusted and admired Sidney Pollack as a director. And I think the fact that Sidney Pollack emphasized that there would be rewrites and that he would bring in other writers, I think finally that in effect, the combination wore Redford down. He just capitulated in the end, but he had a lot of hesitation about it. You know, that's what makes investigating these movies fun because you think out of his great hesitation came this movie that people were all still talking about. Flaws and all, it's a great love story. Oh, it sure is. I was fascinated by the parts of your book that dealt with the conflicts between the screenwriter, Arthur Lawrence, and the director, Sidney Pollack, over trying to strike the right balance between a love story and a political story. And corollary to that, the extent to which the Robert Redford character should be fleshed out. Arthur Lawrence was eventually fired, then he was hired back, but he was so upset with the finished product that he quit. Looking back in retrospect, was he right? Well, I think as, as happens with stories like this, where you have two such uh, conflicting creative visions as Pollock and Lawrence, I, I think the question of right or correctness lies somewhere in the middle. 
And I think Sidney Pollack was right in the sense of people were more interested in the love story than in the politics. They wanted to know, were they going to get together again? Were Katie and Hubble going to have a happily ever after? And, you know, Arthur Lawrence could be, he was famously difficult and acerbic is the word I would say. On Arthur Lawrence's side is the fact that this was Arthur Lawrence's screenplay. It was incidents from his own life. And I think any writer would be really upset to not only be rewritten, which is part of Hollywood, but by 11 different writers, including Francis Ford Coppola, that would make anybody upset. So I th think somewhere in the middle, you know, compromise is the, is the actual fact of it all. And uh, as I talk about in the book, the first sneak preview was going swimmingly until two thirds through when the politics came to the foreground and when they cut 10 minutes of politics out overnight with a razor blade that they were out of town in San Francisco with a razor blade. They played it the next night without the politics and it worked. So, you know, it's what makes the film choppy at the end, but at the same time, it helps the love story. I think Pollock was right. I think if you had added 10 more minutes of politics, political mm -hmm. discussion, into that movie, it would have become very didactic, doctrinaire. Mm -hmm. It would have had this tautological feel to it, like we were being lectured at. It would just have not been as compelling. I really think Pollock was right and Lawrence was wrong. Well, yeah, I, I understand why you're saying that. Certainly the love story is what we all remember more than we do the speeches about people are their principles. So it's a, you know, all of these films are the visions of many different people. And for me, you know, and to, to this day, if you look at the DVD, the 25th anniversary DVD, they include a couple of the cut scenes. And Barbara still feels very strongly about these. I, there's a scene that didn't make it into the final print that I think not only would have deepened the film, but I think would have gotten Barbara the Oscar, which is a, a really, really great two minute scene where they are talking about their parents and how it's hard for Hubble to tell his parents that he loves them. You know, that wasp reticence and Barbara's listening and she looks up at him and she says, I love you, Hubble. And he looks at her and he looks away. He can't say, I love you, Katie. And it's so devastating, the look on her face. And I thought, why did they cut that? That would have really deepened the film. So we all have our opinions about these things. Yes. And Streisand herself was very upset about one particular scene that was cut. It's a scene in which she sees a university student engaged in a protest, a younger version of herself. And she cries because she realizes that she sold out in order yeah. to please Hubble. Her anger about that scene being cut had a lot to do with her decision to become a director, didn't it? A absolutely. Yeah. I think she felt that, you know, here's Barbara Streisand, one of the most powerful actors in Hollywood. And still, she didn't have the final say. And she thought, if I direct, I, you know, and produce all of which she did on Yentl, then she felt she could have the final say. And she did it. I, I think Yentl's a great film that's underrated. And one of the things I include in the book, because it just made me smile so much, was when the New York Times wrote, rule number one in show business, never bet against Babs. Oh, <laughs> that is really true. Is that ever true? And I would never bet against Tom either. <laughs> I know that for Arthur Lawrence and probably Streisand and Redford, the political aspects of the movie, especially about the Hollywood blacklist, were very important to them. But don't you think that for most movie fans, the real appeal of the movie was to see these two huge superstars, Barbara Streisand and Robert Redford, in a love story? Yeah, I, I think I think the politics is what gives the film 
heft and even though those sequences are a little choppy it it grounds the love story more makes it about more something more weighty so that's good but i think absolutely you you want to look at this is the peak of their screen careers it's the peak of how great they both looked on screen the way they were shot and that you know the music the music is hugely important in the appeal of this film there are shots of them sailing on a sailboat in the ocean off the California coast. And with the sunlight filtered, it, it looks so romantic. And then this 60 piece orchestra sweeps up in the background. It's like the orchestra is pushing the boat. And I think, oh, this is romantic filmmaking at its best. You know, nothing wrong with that. Sidney Pollack said in his later years that although The Way We Were was an extremely successful film from a commercial point of view, it was never an ultimately satisfying picture in terms of what it set out to do. What do you think he meant by that? I, I think he really meant about the politics and the, all of the grounding of the love story in the fact that they were opposites politically in college years and and then in 1950s Hollywood. I think he had some regrets over the cutting of those sequences in terms of enriching the film itself, but he was there to please the audience, which the film ultimately did in a very big way. I, I think, look, the at heart, he may have been upset about the political sequences, but it is a love story. And it's the, you know, as I said earlier, it's about loving the wrong person. And everybody has loved the wrong person at one point or another, male or female, every single one of us. And and I floated this theory. I, I love to tell this story by my friend, Janine Basinger, who's a fantastic film writer and scholar. And she said, Tom, you're right. This is about loving the wrong person because everybody's loved the wrong person. And then she said, except maybe 10 people and who wants to know them? And I thought, absolutely. You know, this is, it's the universality of it. So. Well, uh, I think Tom, that Sidney Pollack was getting at more. I, I agree that he was getting at the fact that the movie didn't deal with the political issues that it raised. Mm-hmm. But it also didn't present a fair contrast between Katie and Hubble's opposing philosophic approaches to life. Oh, the, are you speaking about the fact that she was, it didn't come through enough that she was such a go-getter go and that he coasted through life? Yeah. Well, I, I understand what you're saying because there is at the end in that famous farewell in front of the Plaza Hotel, you kind of realize she has had the more fulfilling life, right? She's re She has remarried. She has a daughter. She's still politically passionate. He's kind of sold out. He never wrote another novel. He's writing for television. And he's the character that seems more lost. And I think maybe Sidney Pollack felt that that should have been fleshed out even more. It's a good point. Now, Tom, as you know, there were mixed reviews when the movie came out. Roger Ebert gave it three stars, but Time magazine said it was ill-written, wretchedly performed, and tediously directed. Pauline Kael said the plot made little sense. But generally, the mainstream media gave the movie positive reviews. And when I look at the enduring appeal of the movie all these years later, for me, it's so very relatable as you said, because everybody at some point in their life has been in love with the wrong person because they follow their heart, I guess, and not their head. That's yeah. what really touches people about the movie. That's really the point that you feel resonates, isn't it? I, I do think that. And I, I think it, it touches our emotions. It touches something very elemental in our worldview. I know that sounds sort of highfalutin, but I, I actually believe that. And I, I think, you know, the divided critical response, I think there is oftentimes a disconnect between what is popular and what critics approve of. And I think what 
Robert Redford had the best take on this. I, I, I was so interested by what he said that I put it word for word in the book. And here's what Redford himself said. He said, critics had trouble with the way we were because they won't own up to their own emotions. They figure it's got to be off center or bold before they can accept it. Intellectually, you know Katie and Hubble shouldn't be together, but on a gut level, you want them to make it because you like them and because they like each other. That's a fair emotion. It says it all, and I it, it's great. And also, Robert Redford is such a big star and has done so much that he can take on the critics, and it doesn't. It's not going to affect his standing. <laughs> Tom, do you wish there had been a sequel to the movie? I do, actually. I mean, on the one hand, you sort of think, let's leave things well enough alone. You know, kind of like there shouldn't be a sequel to Casablanca. But on the other hand, I just want to know. And of course, there's that part of me that wants Katie and Hubble to get together. And they three versions of a sequel were written, but just something was always wrong. The timing was off or the script wasn't right. Redford and Streisand's schedules were so different. And I think they had a very interesting idea for the sequel. And I think people say to me, well, what, what was the sequel going to be? What was the storyline? And I always say, well, to find out, you have to read my book. And then, and then I say, I have my own idea for a sequel that still could work. So it, yeah, I do. So, you know, I, 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 you want to see them try to make it work once again. And sequels, you know, almost never work, except, of course, for Godfather Part Two, which is one of the masterpieces of all time. Yeah, I'm, I would be very nervous about a sequel. Now, Tom, I can't resist asking you this question. I apologize in advance. It's about the Academy Awards ceremony. When Barbara Streisand refused to perform the song on the show, they got Peggy Lee to do it. And in my opinion, she did a terrible job. She even got the lyrics mixed up. Who do you think should have sung the song if Barbara Streisand wasn't going to do it? Well, I, I think when Barbara decided, you know, Barbara said no, because that was during the point where she was not performing live. And then at the last minute, she said yes, but Peggy Lee had already agreed and changed her concert schedule and they couldn't disrespect her. You know, Peggy Lee was such a great singer that on paper it would have been a good choice, but she was off that night. The other incredible version of The Way We Were that I've heard that everybody could look up on YouTube is look at the footage of Doris Day singing The Way We Were from a television special. It is a knockout. And, but of course, Doris didn't perform live either. So uh, it's always the what ifs that interest us, isn't it? Yes. And I, I was thinking long and hard about who should have sung it. I had Doris Day on my list, Melissa Manchester or Diana Ross. Yeah, all great choices. And the one other person I would put in there because of her terrific recording is Gladys Knight. Oh, yes. Gladys Knight, it was a great, great singer and did that terrific version that was a hit single for her as well. It's a great song that Marvin Hamlish and the Bergmans wrote. Oh, for sure. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Tom Santo Pietro, order his books and see his personal appearance schedule by going to his official website, TomSantoPietro.com. Well, Tom, it's been wonderful having you back on the show, and I can't wait to see you again when your next book comes out. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. This is always great fun and interesting. I always learn something from one of your questions, and that's great. And I learned so much from your books. They're such a pleasure to read. You are a wonderful person to interview because you're so focused. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on once again. We'll, I hope we'll do it again uh, a year from now when the next book comes out. I can't wait. 
Our guest has been author Tom Santo Pietro, whose latest book, The Way We Were, The Making of a Romantic Classic, is available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my wonderful managers, Rick and Robin at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.